Okay, I'm back. Jeff Rents here. That's R E N S E dot com. That's the website. Uh, do stop by, say hello. 13,000 articles up there now for you. Yeah, it's quite a place and uh, a lot of research potential. Use the site search engine if you're looking for anything in particular. What we're going to do is invite, and they've agreed, Sheila Ostrander and Lynn Shorter to come back very soon and we'll do an entire program, or most of one at least, on super learning. Uh, this is something I don't want to give short shrift to. It is uh, such a remarkable thing they've come up with. I want to make sure we cover it completely and give you folks a chance to call in and ask questions. In the meantime, do go to their website. Much information is online for you right now to get you started. And all you have to do is click on the link right below their name on my home page. Or remember, superlearning.com. It's one word, superlearning. Dot com. So let's carry on with our, our just amazing discoveries uh, from the book Psychic Discoveries with Lynn and Sheila. And let's talk about this hour, uh, that line that I mentioned last hour, artificial reincarnation to unleash talent. There are some drawings in the book which are <laughs> intriguing, doesn't come close. Uh, Sheila, go ahead and start. Well, it was invented by Dr. Rykoff, who was a master hypnotist, and he discovered that if you put a person into hypnosis and said to them that they were a famous artist from the past, such as uh, Rembrandt or one of the others, you see, uh, and then told them to begin painting, they uh, developed astounding abilities, and they painted far beyond their capabilities uh, in their ordinary, regular, everyday personality. So he began doing this on a big scale, and he had all kinds of people uh, incarnated as these different famous artists, and he went on from that to have people as famous inventors and everything else in order to unleash all this creativity that is just uh, apparently just rampant in us all, and it only needs a little bit of a, a nudge to reveal it. Was was this a, a case, Lynn, of them actually somehow getting these people to tap into the consciousness that was Rembrandt, Brandt, Raphael, or any of the other scientists that were used? Or was it just uh, getting these people to more or less probe into their own unused potential? I suspect it was the latter. Um, People would say, I am Raphael, I am Rembrandt. In fact, if you had two Rembrandts in an art class, once they got, in one instance, they got in a fight because each one insisted they were Rembrandt. Really? So this was really being done on a, on a serious scale. Oh, yeah. This, this was deep hypnotic trance, somnambulistic trance, but the difference was usually that's passive. This was active. They could be interviewed by reporters when they're in the state. And I should say that over time, say five, six, eight months, the talents that they unlocked were available to them in everyday life. In other words, it filtered down into consciousness. And they stayed, the talents stayed with them. Yes. Right, did. did any of them start to, to talk like or actually project that they were the people they were told they were? Did they, did they, were they able to access any information which might lead us to believe that they actually were in touch with the consciousness that was that person? Well, I don't, we don't know that. Um, and I, they wouldn't have published it if they had because you weren't supposed to be able to do that under the old Marxist ideology. Yes. What was interesting, and actually we should say this, this is not, don't, don't try this at home as they say, because what you're basically doing is developing a, a schizophrenia or a, a multiple personality is essentially what you're doing. And I think it should be under the care of a doctor. It's not something to do, but it does show you that if you have permission, like many of these people when they first saw their drawings, when they right. come snap to would say, I couldn't have done that. I, I didn't do that. Yeah, I can, yeah, oh yeah, it must have been a shock. So they got permission, and in fact, some of them changed their careers and went into art after this. So, but you could do it with violin playing, they were doing it with inventing, they were doing it with mathematics. And one thing they were doing, but again, they didn't publish much on it, was the inventor of the future, trying to have them look into what would be the future inventions. And I don't know what they found, but it'd be interesting to know. Why aren't we doing work like this? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I know some people have tried it here, but I've never heard of it being done on much of a scale. If you can actually suggest someone into enhanced life potential like that, that, that that's that's amazing. Well, in a sense, super learning works on that. Uh, one of the tricks of super learning or accelerated learning, whatever you want to call it, is imagining you're somebody else, but not to that degree. In other words, you really want to play yeah. tennis wonderfully. You, you imagine you're Monica Seles or something. You take a template and you, uh, you understand. You put it over you. Okay. Right. All right, we're going to do that whole show, uh, Super Learning. Uh, and Again, if you join us late, d don't miss it. Uh, this is an extraordinary thing they've come up with. Literally, between them, I guess we could say, 
what, almost 80 years of experience in this field? <laughs> hey, oh, I have to do it. Oh, oh, boy. A century. How about but remember, you, were, you started when you were a teenager, so it's okay. Yeah, it's, uh, all right. It's all right. Okay. <laughs> Geez, it's amazing. And looking at these pictures uh, in the book explains so much. Um, talent blossoms in a student hypnotically reincarnated as the artist Raphael. Uh, picture A is her first trance drawing, and you look up and you see picture A of this particular student. B was done in the 17th reincarnation session. And B is, what a difference. The face is amazing. They look uh, better in real life, too, than they well, it's, it's the same person just didn't draw that. I mean, it just doesn't look like it. Uh, C, in the 21st reincarnation session, as it were, she drew the final portrait in her normal waking state when her new talent had stabilized after three months of reincarnation training. This is just amazing. I could see schools opening, teaching this kind of etiquette, as it were. This is amazing. Well, you know what? In in the super learning, people have become novelists by doing this, uh, and, and most remarkable result uh, in getting their novels published all over. Their creativity just blossomed because they believed they were famous novelists, and they began writing, and it just flowed <laughs> to them. And it's the same thing okay. with creative the, the creative process. Well, you you get an idea, Pretty listeners, fascinating. of of what super learning, and yeah. we'll, we'll do that program as soon as we can schedule it. And we'll go through it step by step. And this is essentially uh, the most uh, incredible advance in learning technology that I have ever heard. And I've, I've spent some time reading through it. And you have a real treat in store for you. Okay, I mentioned before the break, Mercury in retrograde and astrology. Let's uh, Lynn, take it from the top, astrology as perceived by the Soviets and the scientists you talked to. Well, probably should not be called astrology. It uh, probably should be called biocosmology. And the idea is the influence or effect or something like that of outer space objects, planets, stars, etc., as we would say. But it doesn't really have too much to do with whether you're a Leo or a Taurus or an Aries or something like that. Oh, don't take the fun out of it now. But it is a lot of fun. <laughs> it really started, what we got into was this whole birth control method using, um, well, it came from Czechoslovakia. And this sounds funny because here we are in the middle of this communist regime. But doctors in Czechoslovakia and Hungary, which still had Catholic populations, were trying to find a way to improve the rhythm system, yeah. which may be nice, but only works three out of ten times, which isn't so great if you don't want to keep having children. All right. And they found that this was a method to do it. And it's based on the angle between the sun and the moon at a woman's birth and on a secondary fertility period. Like once a month there's a fertility time, and that's when rhythm says, don't do it, swear off. Okay, now that, that's a secondary factor. Yeah. All right. And so the moon, the moon angle is primary. Yes. Oh. And they found it can be used, well, Sheila can tell you more about this, but it can be used, one, it was, they were using it for birth control, but then they found they could also use it to help infertile couples, which is as a big thing over here right now, right. to help choose the sex of a child. And this was first used in animal husbandry, where it's really kind of important, I think, what sex you have. So there was quite a bit of testing on this thing, and it always sounded quite odd, but... People were using it all through Czechoslovakia and Hungary, and then some people started to use it in England and America. I don't know how many are using it now, but I think it might be a good idea to bring it back because it's a natural method. Well, so beyond you... that, it ensures the uh, birth of a very healthy child. A great many people had come to these doctors because they had had miscarriages over and over, and no matter what happened, they lost their child. It's quite a tragic thing to people to do that. And so he cal did these calculations. This is Dr. Eugene Yonash, who is the one who developed this, who came from Slovakia. And uh, these calculations showed the most... Uh, favorable time to try to conceive and if you chose that time then you could have a viable child who would be healthy and have a long life and and you could also choose its sex so from this moment forward I mean these people who had had a, a history of tragic uh, miscarriages and terrible losses they were uh, I mean you have to see they were ex extremely ecstatic Wow, amazing okay astrology Influence of planetary bodies on living beings on the planet Earth. Makes sense. When the astrologers talk about the stars, they're really talking about the planets. Uh, we have, of course, energy fields out there that we have yet to even grasp. 
which could be at work on all of us. Uh, there is no doubt uh, that things do change from time to time. Uh, the fun part of it was, was certainly the labeling, the uh, the 12 signs of the zodiac. But the fact that it, I know you wouldn't take away the fact that there is an influence. There are people now proposing that space, of course, is anything but empty. It's a vast energy field, and in fact, space is uh, the universal consciousness. And the planets, as they move through this emptiness in space, allegedly create energy ripples, if you will, which can be certainly felt here on the planet and influence all of us. How would you state in your most eloquent language what that influence might best be described as? How, how does it appear to you, Lynn Schroeder? There is an influence somehow, some way. What do you see it as? I think there are two things. The Russians had done a lot of work on what sunspots do to you. Um, they supposedly had a hotline from the observatory to the sanitariums where they're, when they were dealing with heart patients. And when the sunspots were coming they would alert them ahead because it takes a day and a half or whatever to get here. Heart patients. Yeah, and they had other things like um, they, they were able to track that fender benders and that kind of accidents went up at certain times when there were flares on the, on the sun. Right. Which apparently affected people's nervous systems. So that's, one thing that, that's one thing that has not been factored into astrology so far as I know, solar activity, solar cycles. There was also in Czechoslovakia and some of the satellite countries you we went to, people that were practicing astrology in the way we would practice it, of character or what's going to happen uh, predicted in the future. And I must say, to give astrology a little bit of boost, when we were invited to this conference in Russia, we had to know when it was going to be because you had to tell um, in tourists ahead of time. You couldn't change plans once you got there, and they kept changing the date of the conference. So we went to an astrologer who was an old friend and asked what was the most likely date that this conference would happen. And she was right. We booked for those days, and unlike the British who had to leave the second day of the conference because he'd booked their own dates, we were among the few Westerners who got to stay the whole thing because the astrologer picked the right date. So I thought that was very helpful, too. Very helpful. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, Sheila, your thoughts on astrology? Well, I think it's a very, very interesting science, and there's still more to be uh, uh, discovered about it. Now, some but people say it's the oldest science of all. I think it may be, but there's still more things that need to be understood and uh, added in about it. But uh, w we can uh, consider a lot of the research being done in the uh, Slavic countries is extremely important to be added in. And I think that many Western astrologers have started to learn about some of it and adding uh, have added some of it to their uh, their uh, knowledge about uh, how to do the predictions. And uh, it, I think that uh, that's extremely important as well. Do you ever read the astrology? forecast just for fun sometime? Sure. Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, we have friends who are astrologers, well, so we certainly read their books. I thought you might. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the newspaper, too, now and yeah. then. I noticed they, there was a report came out not long ago from London that Yeltsin had, one of the heads of his security uh, brigade over there, yeah. was an astrologer and checked everybody's horoscopes and checked out the people around Yeltsin and tried to predict what might be happening. So I think it's coming back in the Soviet we're, Union. We are finding, way. yeah, oh, well, we're finding out all the time. Presidents uh, from, from sure. de Gaulle and, and uh, Mitterrand, I guess, and over here, the Reagans, and uh, they all use astrologers. Yeah, seems. they did. That's certainly true. They did. And going back to World War II, the uh, whole occult thing, both sides oh. were into oh, it up to yes. their eyeballs, not just the Germans, everybody was. That's correct. That is correct. Yeah, it was Mackenzie King of Canada was doing it, Roosevelt, I mean, they're all involved. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, now, next, next topic. Okay. Uh, the, the man who kept his employees, I, I can't wait for this one, in a trance for 20 years, how did he do it? Who, who was it and how did he do it? was Bratislav Kafka, and he was very well known in Czechoslovakia as a sculptor, and he was very well Kafka? Known. Kafka. As, as in novel. Franz Kafka? As in Franz, yeah. but okay. yeah. And seemed to live a more cheerful life. In the room. Okay. <laughs> this one, what he did was, he had hypnotized something like 16,000 people, and he lived in kind of a castle, and they have a lot of those out there in Czechoslovakia, right. in the countryside. Right. And he picked the seven best people of all those 16,000. Seven best. Somehow convinced them that they would like to spend 15 to 16 hours a day in trance. 